Greetings everyone. Today we're going to be talking about Joachim of Fior, who was born around 1135 and died around 1202. As a young man, he made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in around 1159, where he underwent a spiritual conversion away from his previously worldly life. Upon returning to his homeland, he lived as a hermit before joining the Cistercians in Calabria, later becoming a priest in 1168 and then abbot in 1177. Joachim devoted his time to study of scripture and to its spiritual meanings. Later, the Pope relieved him of his abbot's duties, thus enabling him to write three influential works. Upon completion, Joachim submitted these writings to the Pope for ecclesiastic approval, but died before receiving it. His writings included the Book of Harmony of the New and Old Testaments, the Exposition of the Apocalypse, and the Psaltery of the Ten Strings. Joachim was renowned for his holiness and is most famous for his theological theories about the dawning of the third period of history, which would usher in the kingdom of the Holy Spirit. Now, a number of his theories, particularly on the Trinity, were condemned after his death as heretical by the Fourth Ecumenical Lateran Council in 1215, and later by Pope Alexander IV in 1255, as well as the Council and Synod of Arles in 1260 and 1263. His theories on history effectively replaced the predominant Augustinian concept of history that had informed Western Christendom up until that time. So let's take a brief look at Augustine's view of salvation history. Augustine never wrote a systematic theology of revelation, but we do find some elements scattered throughout his works, such as revelation is bound up with time and takes the form of history. And for this reason, history has theological meaning. For Augustine, the whole Old Testament is a journey towards Christ. Christ is the divine logos, who gives meaning to all of history. And although history is transitory, its end is Christ. In the City of God, we discover Augustine's attempt at a theolo theology of history, which helps Christians who are living side by side with pagans to discern their place in history. For Augustine, the biblical story has to be anchored in a more general history of antiquity. Sacred history begins with the fall of Adam and Eve and is found in scripture. That is, the events of history are relevatory of God. But profane or sacred history is outside the Bible. Secular history is not divinely inspired whereas sacred history is. It is apparent then that Augustine follows St. Paul's division of sacred history into three periods. First of all, in Latin, sub natura, or living according to nature, runs from Adam through to Moses, and this is the period of the patriarchs. Second, sub lege, or living according to the law given to Moses, this runs from Moses to Christ and incorporates both the law and the prophets. And then finally, sub gratia, or living according to the law of grace, which runs from Christ until his second coming. But this isn't the only division of history used by Augustine. He had another division of sacred history, which was foreshadowed by the six days of creation. First, the period from Adam to Noah and the flood, from Noah until Abraham, from Abraham until David, from David until the Babylonian captivity, and then from the captivity until Christ. And then finally, from Christ until the end of time in the Perusia. The sixth and final period of history 
of indefinite length was anticipated and aimed at by the preceding periods, and after it there will be no other periods. In light of Christ, the five preceding eras could be reduced to just one. Everything preceding Christ looked toward him. The sixth period proclaimed Christ by the gospel. From Christ until the end of time, history is homogenous, and therefore Augustine could say that Christ is the end of all time, all history. Now let's look at Joachim's view of history. He thought that Augustine's view necessitated Christians to constantly look back to the Incarnation. He wanted to know how Revelation could be relevant to Christians in the present and the future. So he pro proposed that a new era of the church would come and it would look radically different. It will be the era of the Holy Spirit where the church would be replaced by the order of the just, making the church's hierarchical institutions obsolete. In the new era, men would truly live in accordance with the New Testament and the Sermon on the Mount without precepts and laws. Joachim determined the time when the new era would arise based on Revelation 11.3 and 12.6, which speaks of 1260 days, 1260 days. Hence, the new era would come around the year 1260 AD onwards and would be proclaimed by the new Elijah and new Enoch figures. Now, interestingly, Joachim's vision of history took a Trinitarian form. For him, the period of God the Father was the Old Testament period, a period of strict law and a time of the order or way of married life. The period of God the Son was the period of the church, strangely initiated by King Josiah, but beginning to bear fruit in Christ and lasting until Joachim's time. It is the time of the order of clerics. And then the third period was that of God, the Holy Spirit. And this will be a period of the spiritual church, which will bring reconciliation between East and West, Jew and Christian as well as true freedom from the law. It will be a time of the monastic order, which began with St. Benedict, but will bear fruit in the last times, that is in the 13th century, until the end of the world. During this period, the spirit will triumph over flesh through contemplation and hence the link to St. Benedict's monasticism. But in the future, a new form of monasticism would arise. This era would see the eruption of the Holy Spirit within history as the age of the church with its hierarchical structures coming to an end. Finally, the end of history will be imminent with the coming of the kingdom of God on earth. What is revolutionary about Joachim's theory of history as a history of progress with its three ages is that revelation is no longer consigned to the past, but now is inextricably bound up with history in the present and future. That is, revelation is continuing. Now, St. Francis of Assisi, he was born in 1181 and died in 1226. After a radical conversion of life to Christ and the call of Christ to rebuild my church, Francis founded a little community which later became the Order of the Friars Minor, with his rule officially promulgated in 1221. After his death, a movement arose within part of the Friars Minor called the Franciscan Spirituals, who were strict observers of St. Francis's way of life and rule. Now, what distinguishes the Franciscan spirituals is their embrace of the teachings of Joachim of Fior about the coming age of the spirit, which they saw as inaugurated by themselves. They interpreted Joachim's prophecy of the new prophets, Elijah and Enoch, 
as fulfilled in St. Francis and St. Dominic, the founder of the Dominicans. And hence, the two new mendicant orders would usher in the age of the Holy Spirit. These were seen as the new form of monasticism foreseen by Joachim. Now, in light of Joachim's theology of history, perhaps you can think about some echoes of this sort of thing throughout the ages.